Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, Les now is uh, going to be talking about how to rule the internet. Um, if you have, um, would you like the questions during the presentation or preferably after? During is fine. Okay. So um, thank you and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Hi. I'm Vesna, I'm from RIPE NCC, and I want to invite you to take part in uh, internet governance. But before I start, I want to put things in perspective a little bit. Yesterday at 11, there was a talk uh, from uh, a scientist who presented a lot of information saying that uh, our civilization and or together with the Earth is going towards a collapse in the next 50 years. So with that in mind, the importance of internet governance, well, you can decide for yourself like uh, how far uh, do we get to go. Well, the good news is we only have to keep the internet running for 15 more years. Yeah, that's a good news. So we don't need IPv6. OK, this is the last time I mentioned IPv6. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, uh, the, uh, this is going to be a story about one of the ways in which you can take part in the internet governance. There are many ways, but I will explain the one in which RIPE NCC has the role and how can you take part. Why did I even want to talk about this? Well, I think that the RIPE and hackers have a lot in common. And uh, partially it's the people, so uh, there is a big overlap between the RIPE community and the hackers community. So uh, it's the people who work for ISPs, for hosting companies, for other internet-related businesses. It's people who write free software, who, who work on uh, open hardware, security professionals, students, academia. And th th this is kind of an overlap between the communities. The other thing that we have uh, in common, what is similar both in the RIPE community and the hackers community, is the way how we make decisions. So it's the not hierarchical, it's decentralized, and it's the consensus-based decision-making process. And it, they're all also open to everybody to join. They're transparent, they're well-documented, they're bottom-up, so they are not hierarchical and imposed from somewhere else, like some laws and, and rules, but they are created by us, by the community. Also, there is a lot of uh, three-level, three-letter acronyms involved in both of these communities, and uh, I will be mentioning a lot of these today. I'll try to explain them uh, for the first time that I mentioned them, or maybe I'll also just skip them, so if there is any question, just let me know. And both the RIPE community and the hackers would want to have better internet. We are both building the better internet for some definition of better. So this is something that we need to agree on here and also in the RIPE community, what kind of internet do we want to build. So since the internet is so complex, somebody compares it uh, also with the ecosystem. And there is a lot of different parts to it. And some of them I even skipped on this slide. I can't see much. But uh, this, this is from the ISOC, Internet Society. They created this picture. You can also find it on their website. And it, it just makes a collection of all these actors who are involved in, in internet. Uh, it's the naming and addressing. I'll start from... Uh, where I'm coming from, so the domain name system and the IP addresses, then open standards development, where I would also add open source and free software development, organizations like IETF and WC3 and many others. Then, poof, I don't even see it myself, so the shared global services and operations, so the actual uh, physical network that, uh, that forms the internet, users, so among the users are also listed the, the vendors, so people who actually make the equipment. Education and capacity building is in this corner, which also includes the internet society, but also academia and research uh, and governments. And here is purple, and that is local, national, regional, and global policy development. So the actual decision makers, the actual lawmakers that are somehow involved in, in also running the internet or influencing the internet for us. So 
it is complex, but I will try to touch upon mostly this part, so the, the addressing and naming, and uh, technical running of the network. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go through the brief introduction to what RIPE is and what RIPE NCC is. So how many of you um, have ever heard of RIPE? Okay, then there are a few that haven't. How many of you know the difference between RIPE and RIPE NCC? Okay, <laughs> oh great, so this is my, one of my favorite topics. So I'll start with, uh, I'll start in the middle of the story and that is RIPE NCC. So RIPE NCC is, stands for RIPE Network Coordination Center. I'll explain later what RIPE is. So the uh, RIPE NCC is one of the five regional internet registries. That means that um, we register and actually give out IP addresses and AS numbers, and that is done in the hierarchical way. So, okay, I'll get back to this uh, later. So this is the way how the addresses are actually distributed. So on the top, well here actually even more on the top is IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, and they gave out a chunk of in this case, IPv6 addresses to IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, which is kind of part of ICANN, which stands for something else. And then they give large chunks to regional registries. One of them is RIPE NCC. Then we give large chunks to local internet registries, and they give addresses to their customers. So that's how it works, and this is where the RIPE NCC fits in the, in the chain let's say. So these are the other four. So currently there are five regional registries. This was not the case when I started working for RIPE NCC, which was in 99. There were only three. So there were ERIN for North America and at that time also for uh, South America, APNIC for Asian Pacific, and RIPE NCC for uh, Europe, uh, Russia, former Soviet republics, Middle East, and at that time, also, we were serving uh, North of Africa, and Erin was serving South of Africa. In the meantime, two new regional registries were created, so this is not um, a, a static system. It is developing, uh, even in my, during my time. So the two newest ones are LACNIC for Latin America and Caribbean, and Afrinic. And they are more or less all the same. Uh, in a sense that they're all not-for-profit organizations. They are membership organizations. So, they, uh, for example, RIPE NCC has currently 9,000 members. And they get money from these membership fees. And this year, the membership fee is 1,800 euros for a year. So, uh, from, from that money, we pay the people to actually register these IP addresses and distribute them to the local internet registries and do some other services. I will come to that later. But the rules that we actually use to distribute these addresses, we as in RIPE NCC where I work for, are not decided by us. We don't decide those rules. We don't sit in a, in a meeting with three people from our company and say, okay, let's uh, give everybody whatever, slash 32 of IPv6. It's, it's a kind of a chunk of addresses. No, these rules are decided by the community. So RIPE community, in this case, is the people from LIRs and other ISPs and anybody else. And they say, OK, we need to somehow distribute this finite resource. What would be a good rule to do that? OK, let's start small. Whoever wants some addresses, they will get a smallish chunk because they don't know how much they will need. Once they use it up, they go back to RIPE NCC and they ask for more, and then we see how fast they used up the chunk that they got, and then we give them enough to last them for some time in the future. So all these numbers, like how much in the future and how big the addresses should be, is something that people discuss in the RIPE community. And then when they agree on that, then RIPE NCC says, okay, from now on we will do this. So those are the policies. And this, this organization, RIPE NCC, and other regional registries are therefore neutral because they have to coordinate the, the work of ISPs that are actually competitors to each other. So they have to have a neutral body that they trust that is going to be impartial. And the processes are open and transparent, so we have to 
demonstrate how did we implement those policies. So we have to actually tell back to these ISPs, like this is how we did it. And this is our understanding of the policies and this is why we made a certain decision and so on. So everything is open and transparent. So there, uh, in every region, this process is a little bit different. For example, in RIPE NCC service region, the block of addresses given to every ISP when they come to us was larger than in Africa because of the economic situation. So the African community, they said, well, when the ISP comes to Afrinic, their block should be a bit smaller because they're not going to use it up in two years, uh, the same, uh, the block of same size as they would in Europe. So uh, there are, the policies are slightly different in if different regions, but there are some joint efforts that have to be done by regional registries uh, as, uh, as well, as a, as a group, and therefore they have created another organization called Number Resource Organization, which represent all the regional registries on certain topics. I covered this, probably I'll come back to this picture, although you can't see it. Okay, so and now, for something completely, well, I already mentioned it, RIPE. RIPE stands for Rizo IP European, so European IP Networks, pardon my French. Uh, it's, it's from the time when um, they thought it's cool to have the mixed French and, and English acronyms. So they came up with RIPE, which a lot of Europeans say RIPE or something else. <laughs> and um, so, as I said, like RIPE NCC is a regional registry. And um, it's a not-for-profit organization, blah, blah, blah. It's a company. It's... Um, actually legally association, so that's, um, what's that in Dutch, Stichting, I guess. Uh, that means that members have to decide on certain things. So it's not the executive board, but the members. Um, and um, we also give services to people who are not our members, and we do have executive board who decide on, uh, uh, who approves the activity plan, but the members vote on the charging scheme, so how much should everybody pay every year. RIPE was there first. RIPE was created three years before RIPE NCC, so that was actually at that point 15 people from mostly research and, uh, research and education networks and CERN and some um, places, and NICEF in Holland, so the high nuclear, uh, high uh, energy and the nuclear physics institute, whatever. And so those were the people who, who had IP networks at that time. There, that was in the time of the, of the protocol war. So there was uh, OSI and there was IP, and they were like, well, which network we are going to build and how are we going to coordinate the work of people who want to build IP networks? So they all got together and said, well, we, we want to re uh, interconnect our networks. So how do we do that? Um, where are we going to register who has which address block? So yeah, let's create a database. And yeah, there was a software around who is, okay, let's use who is, or they wrote it. I don't know, it was a long time ago. And um, yeah, somebody has to maintain a mailing list and we'll have physical meetings and there is a web page. And um, so at that time, it was just a small group of people who said, let's get together and agree on certain things. How are we going to interconnect these networks? And three years later, it grew a little bit. So then they said, well, we need some people that are actually doing this for, for their job. So they created RIPE NCC, which at that time had three people working for it. Right now, there is 120 of us. And we are located in Amsterdam. And uh, we come from all over the world. So there is about people from around 23 different nationalities working for the RIPE NCC. Uh, and RIPE is still a community. So there is no legal entity which is RIPE. And um, RIPE is the one creating policies. So that also means that if you don't agree with those policies, you don't have to implement them. There is nobody who will come and, and chase you and say, oh, you have signed the contract or, or something. Like it's, it's, it's a voluntary participation in these policies which make the internet run. So yeah, if you don't want to break the internet, then you better do it that way. And um, also, on the other hand, if something does break, you can't sue RIPE because it's not a legal entity. So there's nobody to sue. 
the actual working uh, mode of the RIPE community is mailing lists. And there are two physical meetings a year. That used to be three times a year, but then there was a crisis and people didn't have money to travel. So now there is a twice a year uh, a week-long meeting, five days long meeting. And in the meantime, there's a lot of mailing list discussions. So the policies are developed in this yeah, uh, so-called policy development process, which means anybody can take part. So it's totally open. You don't have to be working for an ISP. You don't have to be from Europe. You don't have to be a member of the RIPE NCC Association. Nothing. You only have to have an email address and interest and willingness to take part in these discussions. It's transparent in a way that you can look back into the mailing list archives and figure out how did this happen? Why did these people 10 years ago agree that we should promote IPv6? Um, for example, oh, I mentioned it again. Um, all the meetings are transcribed. There is a webcast, so you can actually watch it. Uh, remotely. There is a uh, Jabber IRC channel where you can actually give comments remotely and actually take part in these discussions. Um, there are minutes published later and uh, since recently sometimes there's even translation. Oh yeah, there are stenographers so then you know if you don't understand what the speaker is actually saying even if you're sitting there then you can read the stenographer's uh, transcript and sometimes that's really helpful. And the policy development process, as I said, it's a consensus based, it's a bottom up, and uh, somebody makes a proposal, people discuss it endlessly. Oh, actually, there is some kind of time schedule, but often it, that also slips. So there is a lot of time given to these discussions to give a chance to everybody to, to have a say, but it also means you have to be really patient because it, everything, it takes a long time. It takes a very long time to reach the consensus. So once there is some kind of policy agreed, then RIPE NCC implements that and all the other providers do it that way. Again, in all the regions it's done the same. So it's, it's, it goes like this and only sometimes there is a global policy that has to be agreed in all the regions and then kind of ratified by IANA or ICANN. Yes. Thank you. Uh, before you uh, named an organization of the five uh, regional um, uh, registration entity, and uh, yeah, uh, it's not clear to me the difference between this organization of five and Yana ICAN. Yeah. So this is only about the policies. Let's say the addressing policies. So in the RIP NCC service region, we say. Um, you should be using 32-bit AS numbers before you uh, ask for the 16-bit AS number because these are running out and these we have enough. So this is like a local policy in the RIPE NCC service region. And then in other regions, they say, yeah, that's a good idea, or maybe it started somewhere else, but it doesn't matter. They all say, yeah, this is how it should be. And then they say, well, but... Um, how should IANA gives the, give these blocks of 32-bit AS numbers and 16-bit AS numbers to all the regional registries? Well, that's something that concerns everybody. So then that's like a global policy that has to be agreed on the IANA level. So, uh, and there was a glitch there even because there was a policy which said IANA should give you the block of 32-bit AS numbers only when you don't have any AS numbers left. And it was like, wait a minute, but then you have these 16-bit AS numbers still left, and you run out of 32-bit, for example, run RIP NC service region, and then IANA cannot give us more because we still have 16-bit, but we shouldn't use them because we should conserve them. And it was like, okay, we have to rewrite this. So we just rewrote it, and it's like, okay, now we have a new policy on the global level. So these kinds of details. Might be, but sometimes maybe it's not that silly. So it's difficult to make a judgment when is the silly one and when is the, the one that might have impact on something else in the future. So it's, yeah. <laughs> 
sometimes it's a bit more serious. For example, the transfers between different regions, the transfers of address blocks, which is especially important now when we ran out of IPv4. So uh, in the ripe C service region, you can transfer blocks of IPv4 addresses from one local registry to the other if they are both member of the RIPE NCC. But what if you want to transfer it from uh, ERIN to RIPE? Um, there is no policy like that yet. So it has to be kind of agreed between RIPE community and ERIN community and that on a, on a global level. And also what happens with addresses that are returned to RIPE NCC, should they then be returned to IANA and then given back to everyone or should we keep them and then redistribute them ourselves? So these kind of tricky details. And on the other hand, the number resource organization is about other things. So for example, internet governance. When uh, there is uh, um, a global internet governance forum, for example, or the ITU meeting, and there are some proposals for the internet governance from other uh, organizations, then NRO uh, acts as one unique voice for all the regional registries, so that we don't have to say, well, RIPE community thinks that it should be done that way, and APNE community thinks it should be done that way. We just say, okay, all the regional registries think that it should be done that way. Yeah. So where do you fit in? Well, it depends on, on your interest and your area of expertise. And these are some topics that are already existent in RIPE community and um, where you can take part. So one of the younger working groups is called Cooperation Working Group, which is uh, really less technical, so the others are really about the, the technical aspects of the internet. But this one was created several years ago specifically to, to um, discuss the internet governance topics. So if you are interested in internet governance, then the cooperation working group is where these things are being uh, uh, repeated from the Internet Governance Forum, for example, or the meeting uh, of the ITU and so on. So we, uh, we say, RIPE NCC's position to this uh, is going to be when we go to that meeting, and do you agree? And then people have a discussion like, well, we think you should say it like this, la la la. So this is in the cooperation working group. And also we actively take part in the other Internet Governance Forum from the RIPE NCC, and then we report back to the cooperation working group so that there is some kind of focus uh, there. Also, the cooperation is happening uh, more and more between the addressing uh, uh, side of the internet, which is RIPE NCC, so this kind of critical infrastructure, and governments, regulators, law enforcement agencies who, for example, want data about who is using which network. In which case, we just point them to the WHOIS database and say, well, here it is. It's all publicly documented. You can find it out there. So this is probably the most specific one for the uh, internet governance. But other technical issues are also political, let's say. So um, routing working group is for the people who have interest in BGP uh, or the routing security. Then there is the address policy working group which decides who can have how many addresses, which is kind of critical if you want to run the internet to have access to the unique numbers that you need. So uh, this is where in the address policy working group is where these policies are decided. And mostly that was about IPv4 until, well, recently. And the IPv6 working group was more for the V6 related technical issues, but now it's a bit of a mix because, well, there is no V4 left. So also the IPv6 policies are discussed in the address policy working group. Then uh, there is the anti-abuse working group, which is the quite active recently and in, in most of the flux because it's quite difficult to um, define what is abuse according to certain people. So if is spam abuse or is that content and we don't care about the content, we're just running the underlying network. What is abusive in a certain country, maybe it's not in another country. In Europe, we have so many different cultures. So then the, the network abuse could also be just like attacking somebody's network. So there is a lot of discussions uh, in the anti-abuse working group. And the main result was 
uh, to create uh, clear and, and good quality contact information about network blocks where you can report abuse. So if you are an end user and you think that some other network is attacking you, how can you let know the actual uh, maintainers of that network, people who administer it, that you think that they are, uh, and they should stop? So this, this is uh, currently the main focus on, of the anti-abuse working group. Then there is a DNS issue, so how to run the technical aspects of DNS. Measurements, analysis, and tools working group. So how does the internet perform? Which tools do we use to look at the statistics about the networks? Uh, resilience, speed, and so on. And it was only a few months ago that the open source working group was created. So the first scope was to have the open source routing software discussed there, but then they broadened it a little bit and said, well, okay, anything open source, we will now have a separate list for that. So this is the subset, there is some more, but these are, I think, the most important ones. So you can choose, depending on your area of interest or your area of expertise, where would you like to, to put some efforts. And how does it actually work? Well, there's a mailing list for each one of them. It's open for subscription. So if you're not subscribed, you can't really post. So you just have to subscribe, anybody can subscribe. And then there is also an archive. So you can follow, you can just take a look what was happening in any of these for the last 10 years. And then, uh, well, probably the best thing is, okay, how many of you actually subscribe to one or more of these lists? Okay, yeah, nice. How many of you are going to subscribe to <laughs> one or more of those lists? Yeah, okay. <laughs> check, check out the archives. So unfortunately, there isn't much activity on them. That's really a shame because this is where the, the, the destiny of the internet in Europe is actually being decided. And um, yeah, people don't bother to take part. Actual, uh, like people who work for ISPs and whose job it is to say, hey, wait a minute, in five years, I want to be able to get 16-bit AS number for some reason. How can I make sure that that is actually going to be possible? So, uh, on the, on the lowest level, you can just read those lists. A bit higher uh, activity level is that you actually answer to some posts. Because what people do is they, they suggest the policy and then they have to hear how many people agree and how many people disagree. So if nobody says anything, then the, the working group chairs don't know, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? And sometimes people actually suggest quite bad ideas. So. And then the highest level is that you suggest the change yourself. Oh, I can't come up now with uh, some of the um, silly ideas that, that were suggested. But yeah, for example, I mean, uh, a simple thing. In the anti-abuse working group, somebody said, why don't we just use the email address as a point of contact in every single address block that is registered in the RIPE database? And then they wrote the policy and said, it should be that the email address is referenced, blah, blah, blah. And then, some, and then people said, no, that's a very stupid idea because what if your email address changes, then you have to change it in all those places at the same time. I mean, that, that doesn't scale. So then that policy was shut down. Somebody said, why don't we create a uh, an database object which will be referenced from other objects, and there will be an email address in there, so you don't have to change it. You don't have to change all of them, but just in one place. So that was a bit better, and people said, okay, that's kind of okay. So you said policy, you said policy a few times, but do, do, don't you mean uh, policy proposals? Probably, yeah, yeah. So if you suggest a new thing, it's called a policy proposal until, until it's actually agreed on, and then it becomes policy. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So yeah, while it's still in the process of being discussed, it's a policy proposal. So um, again, um, okay, I used to be a trainer, so we had this mantra, like there are no stupid questions. Well, it's the same here. There are no stupid comments and there are no stupid policy proposals. 
you think it's a good idea, somebody's going to agree with you for sure. And there'll be always people who won't agree with you. So it's always like that. And then because we don't do voting, we do consensus, then we try to overcome all the obstacles and all the people who disagree. We try to like take their input into account and rewrite the policy proposal in a way that they would also agree with it. And then after a lot of iterations, the policy is either agreed or actually, um, yeah, how can I say, shut down or canceled or something, and then we move on. And then either there is no policy or somebody else has to suggest another policy. So if you are a student or if you know some students, we have a, a new program running, which is the RIPE Academic Cooperation Initiative, or so-called RACI. And uh, we started it at the last RIPE meeting, which was in Dublin. And it worked qu out quite well, so it's an invitation for students to suggest um, presentations of their work, and then if they get chosen, they get a free ticket to one of these meetings. And, uh, well, we don't fund their uh, travel expenses, but they find their own ways to actually get that covered. And, uh, and so they get to promote their work among these 500 mostly network operators and, and policy makers and to, yeah, to, to present their work there. So if you want to take part in that, next meeting is in October in Athens. And uh, there is a, a six um, sponsored places uh, like this. So here you can, uh, on this URL or somewhere on the ripe.net, uh, at the end there are also more links. You can find the, the, the how can you apply. So, until now, I was talking mostly about RIPE NCC as a regional registry for distributing uh, IP addresses and AS numbers and the RIPE community, but RIPE NCC does many other things, and uh, um, these are the services uh, of coordination, so yeah, helping organize RIPE meetings, uh, running the K-Root name server, the, which is one of the 13 uh, root name servers around the world, and we have about 15 instances, it, it's Anycast. Uh, so this is not, uh, how can I say, this is funded by the members, but it's a benefit for everybody in the internet. And um, we also uh, maintain uh, something called Ripe Labs, which is like a blogging platform for publishing different kinds of uh, work, uh, uh, documentation about our projects, but also other people when they want to promote their work, which is related to the Ripe community. And we do a lot of data collection and measurements. Um, on the other hand, um, we also do the routing security, so we are developing uh, a resource uh, public key infrastructure, RPKI, together with IETF and other regional registries. And of course, we maintain the RIPE database, which is not only for the LIRs, it's a public database. Anybody can get that information, anybody can query it. Actually, anybody can edit it also to, to a certain extent. And we do a lot of training. Training is only for the RIPE NCC members, but all the um, training material is publicly available on our website. And uh, my current job is to uh, be a community builder for measurements tools. So two main projects that I'm busy with is the RIPE Atlas. I had a presentation about it yesterday. It's a network of small hardware probes uh, that uh, measure the, the speed and the uh, resilience of the internet. This is the t-shirt, you can't really see it here. <laughs> um, so that's part of our research and development uh, efforts. Other things that we do is like we collect all the data about the addresses that we give out. So we store that information, we make it public, and also about the usage of those uh, internet resources and about reverse DNS, because this is also what, uh, what we are responsible for. And for example, and then we display it in a certain way that you can easily uh, access and, and have a visual way of, of grasping what are we doing with these addresses. And one of them is called IPv6 ripeness, which is my baby, so I'm, uh, I like to talk about it. So that actually shows you for every member of the um, uh, RIPE NCC, how far are they with preparation for IPv6 deployment. So do they have address space? Did they do reverse DNS? 
uh, did they register in the routing uh, part of the RIPE database and, uh, and are they actually announcing that address space? Uh, and since recently we also measure uh, do they actually use it? So there is the five star system and you can see here the list of those who have those five stars. Uh, we also do the um, uh, collection of BGP data. So we have something called routing information service where we have route collectors on uh, 15 different parts on the globe and we peer with about 600 peers and we listen to their BGP announcements and store that data for now about uh, 13 years. So we have this 13 year collection of BGP data which is publicly accessible to everybody and, for, and uh, it's for free of course. Uh, it's funded by our members so yeah we, we make it available to everyone and uh, there is a similar project in, um, in the states called Route Views and then based on this data uh, there is a, um, a product now called BGP Mon so monitoring of BGP services, which is actually based on the, on the RIS data and route use. And so we also show this information using RIPESTAT. So that's a tool for accessing all that information that we have. Uh, the newest addition are the actual active measurements. So this Atlas network that I mentioned. So these probes do the pings, trace routes, uh, DNS queries to all the 13 route uh, root name servers around the internet and uh, several times a day from 4,000 different points in the internet. And so all that data is again collected by us and presented publicly to everybody. So you can see on the map how are these root name servers performing and how do the probes from Italy, for example, see the root name server in the States or uh, where are each pro which which any cast instance of for example k root is each probe going to choose and so uh, already based on that data a lot of troubleshooting has been done on the root name server system so that's ripe atlas um, anybody can take part in this so if you want one of these probes in general later when you go home you just go to atlas.tribe.net and you say i would like to apply for for a probe and then we ship it to you. It's for free and you contribute the, the, your bandwidth, electricity and actual availability of this probe to everybody else to do the measurements from your probe. And then if you are hosting one, then you can do your own measurements. So you can say, I want to schedule the trace routes that show how um, are the probes in Australia, what are their paths to my web server in Germany uh, from now for three months in the future and then you know three months later you go and say okay uh, show me the data I want to analyze this and see how how does it look no it's a global network yeah most of them are actually situated in Europe because uh, yeah we, we have the most contact in the community in Europe but there is a lot of them actually all around the world and so all this routing data, reverse DNS data, active measurements, uh, addressing history for the, for the last 20 years, all of that you can see using RIPESTAT. So that's stat.ripe.net. And there is a web page, there are widgets, interactive visualizations, but there is also API. So you can actually uh, code your own queries and make your own visualization of combining this data. There is a text interface, a command line interface, where you can say who is, and then point your who is client to stat.tribe.net, and then you will get the output in a text format. And then there are other tools that are also accessible through there. So that's also what RIPENCC does. And how does this actually help with internet governance? Well, it actually all this data shows the quality of the internet and the, the progression or regression or whatever, the, the, the development of the quality of the internet in a certain region. So, for example, what we are trying to establish now is um, provide the, the measurement data for um, uh, looking into how how is uh, what is the impact going to be for the African continent if in the next five years there are a lot of internet exchange points built in Africa. 
because currently the, the idea is that a lot of traffic actually goes outside of Africa and goes to the states where they actually host their servers. So if you are in some African country and you want to read the local newspaper, your traffic actually goes to states and back. And if there will be an internet exchange, then the traffic might stay local. But again, that's just the ideas. But if we put these probes around and see, OK, how, how does it look like now? And then we measure again in two years, or we measure all the time and see, well, over two years, it turned out that this happened. So this is how then can, uh, this is what can help um, people who make decisions, should there be an internet exchange in another country to say, hey, let's look at what happened in this country and is this what we want to achieve and how long is it going to take, how much is it going to cost and so on. So we provide the data for that. And this is the, the call for action actually to you. So. You are the one who can make this happen better, faster, with different ideas, with a different approach. And the hackers community actually can contribute a lot because you have different concerns. You have different way of looking at this. And um, the ways to do it is subscribing to the mailing list or taking part in one of the meetings. So the meetings of the RIPE community, as I said, happen twice a year. Next one is in October in Greece. After that, uh, it's in Poland, and then either somewhere in UK or in Amsterdam. So we try to go closer to the people in the community, but still it's, it's quite difficult for some of them to travel. So that's why we also have regional RIPE NCC meetings, which are slightly different. They're more uh, of bringing the news and, and presentations uh, to the uh, regional communities. So these happen five times a year. Two are in Russia, two are in Middle East, and one is somewhere in the southeastern Europe of Balkans, which is not the politically correct way to say it. Um, these are for free, but they are also much smaller, and no policies are actually decided on them. These cost 350 euros for a week, unless you're a student and you get this free ticket, or unless you are a, a, a member of the RIPE NCC and you became a member since two years ago, then you get two free tickets to actually take part in these meetings. Then we also have the training courses. They happen once a week all over our service region. Uh, we cover the administrative tasks of being a local internet registry in one course, IPv6 basics in another course, database, so the who is functionings, and uh, routing registry and routing security. So currently we have four courses. We used to have the NSSEC, maybe that's also uh, upcoming. We have e-learning platform, we have webcast, uh, web webinars, and all our material and documentation is publicly available. And if you want to teach this to somebody else, you can just reuse it. Um, so for the members of the RIPE NCC, most of them are free and the members can also influence what the RIPE NCC does by choosing the executive board, for example. And in the end, again, a call, do take part. This is, uh, uh, we are here, the RIPE NCC here is here to facilitate your voice in the internet governance. If you don't know how to uh, take part in all these internet governance fora and so on, you can come to us and we'll help you and we'll make sure that your voice is also heard. So uh, a lot of links here. I'm uh, Miss Measurements at, uh, on, on Twitter. And yeah, uh, RIPE NCC is present everywhere. You can find us everywhere. You can talk to us. We're really interested to, to hear your opinion. And uh, now uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm still here for another yeah, 10 minutes or something. Thank you. There's a mic somewhere. Uh, yeah. The measurement probe, is it available only as hardware only? Yeah. For now, yes. So, yeah, if you want one, I have, uh, I have a stash here. You can get one now, or you can receive one later, wherever you live. We'll ship it to you. 
but for now it's hardware only because we want to uh, it's a matter of, of calibration and a, let's say a matter of security so we are more sure that the measurements that that are performed are all coming from the same platform rather than from somebody's laptop which is then influencing the results there are ideas to maybe move in the other direction but for now this is this is our focus to have a, a separate hardware that performs the measurements the source code on the other hand is available it's on GitHub, so you can install it somewhere else and then just run your own measurements and compare, like what does the probe do towards, I don't know, um, belastingdeans.nl uh, or what your own measurement uh, does with the same software. Uh, hi. Um, how do you uh, set up where it is? positionally on the planet? Uh, does, do you have to give it core GPS coordinates or does it work it out? Or? Um, you, you manually type it in, okay. basically. And we also de determine geolocation based on the IP address geolocation, which is third-party data. It's, it's max mine, so it's not always accurate. And we also add some kind of randomness for the privacy reasons, so it's not really tied to your address unless you want it to. Just wanting from the visualization point of view to chart where it is, you know. Yeah. And sorry, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, does it have a web app? Like, so how do you get the data out of it? Like, yes. There, it? So there is the web interface where you uh, uh, create a measurement through the web, and then you receive the results and you download them. And then there is API. So you can just like it's a REST API, and you can get it from uh, scripting it. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Yes. I mean, uh, is there any minimum requirements to uh, subscribe, like it having a yeah. static IP address? Not a static IP address, but it's going to use certain amount of bandwidth. And it should be on a connection which is more or less permanent. Like, there's no point plugging it into the laptop which you switch off in the night. People do. It's good for monitoring. So there was a colleague of ours whose mother was uh, in uh, Alaska, and she had it like attached to her equipment that she would switch off in the night. Like if she goes to sleep, she switch off, switches off everything. And so her daughter in Holland could actually see when is her mother go going to sleep. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if that's a, the best use case, but <laughs> so yeah, there are some uh, kind of decent bandwidth, let's say. So you shouldn't put it somewhere where it's critical for you that like no bandwidth is wasted on, on certain measurements, but it's not a lot. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's somewhere in the FAQ. I can get back to you later. Thank you for your question. Are there any more questions? Yeah, one more. <laughs> um, about the, um, uh, the courses, the webinars and so on, uh, I didn't understand if they are for free, they are public available, you can download because of the, they are pre-recorded. So the, the actual training courses are only accessible to the RIPE NCC members physically if you want to go there. However, if you ask nicely and they are not completely full, then we will allow guests also. And uh, they happen in all kinds of locations around the world. So, you know, if we go to Vladivostok and we go there once every five years, we are not going to say, sorry, you can't come because you are not really working for an LIR. Also, on the other hand, we don't have very good way of checking who is working for an LIR. So if your friend works for an LIR, registers you to go to the course, yeah, then you go. And the, the webinars, again, um, they, are most, they are for the RIPE NCC members. But again, if you ask nicely, we probably will allow you uh, to, to attend. Thank you. Any more questions? Was all clear? Okay, first half, thank you very much. Thank you. Will you be at the Media Cafe afterwards or? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's questions? a good idea. Yeah.